Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I am your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Robert Leonard. Robert's the VP of Growth and Innovation at the Investors Podcast Network, podcast host of Real Estate 101 and Millennial Investing. He earned his MBA in accounting and finance, a BSBA in finance and economics, and is a certified management accountant. Robert has a ton of experience in the stock market, and now he is in real estate as well. One thing he has become very good at is investing long distance. And that is such a mental hurdle for most people, especially getting started. Most will tell you to never do that, especially in the beginning, right? You want to be able to drive there. What about when somebody calls or a tenant calls and you want to fix that or if you're self-managing? But he goes through how he thinks about that, why he does it this way, even how he's selected markets. It is interesting, the detail that he went through to select the markets that he and his business partner are buying deals in. He talks about a little bit of tech that they use as well to do that. And just some other thoughts that were very helpful in thinking long distance. Again, you have to be willing to sometimes step out of the box, step out of your comfort zone. And sometimes that means investing at a distance. And Robert has done just that. Robert, welcome to the show. I know you have a unique story of how you got into real estate, but then you also have some skill sets that I know are useful to any of us that are in this business. And so looking forward to hearing more about it, diving into it. Give us a little more of your backstory, though, your real estate background and how that came about. Yeah, absolutely. First off, thanks so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. So when I talk about my background, I almost always go back to when I was four years old and people, the guests or the host always looks at me and is like, four years old, you know, where's this going? But I think it's important. And I think it tells a little bit and it differentiates me a little bit from other guests you might've had and even other podcast hosts that they're out there. So I go back to when I was four, I started racing motocross. I ended up racing for about 10 years. So I was about 13 or 14 years old. At that point, I was number two in the world in my age group. So for reference, I like to recommend, like tell people that this is similar to like the minor leagues of baseball or basketball or things like that. So I was like an up and coming prospect to go professional. And in motocross, you can go, this is ATV motocross, you can become professional at 16. And so I was like one of the top prospects to go pro in the next year and a half or so. And so I didn't have a backup plan. Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. Nobody in my family's ever made any investments in anything. All I was going to do is race motocross. That was all I had planned. And then Unfortunately, a couple of events took place. 2008 economy crashed, racing super expensive. The industry started to decline. A couple of people that we knew actually passed away from racing. So there's a lot of things that just combined. And I ended up stopping racing at 14. And I kind of had to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life at this point. And so I was always really good with math and I liked money. So I said, well, why don't I start to study finance? And so I decided to go into finance. I ended up going to college, ended up kind of falling into real estate through house hacking. Kind of a funny story there if you want to dive into that. Why finance? You know, I thought I was thinking about like your, you said nobody's ever invested in your family. Maybe you said nobody going to college. I can't remember now. But what was it about finance that intrigued you at that time? I was just looking at things. I really liked money and I was really good at math. So I said, well, what can I do that combines money and math? And, you know, finance, investing was one of those things. And I knew one of the reasons why I got out of motocross or was forced to get out of motocross was because of money. And so I think this was more subconscious. I didn't consciously think of this, but subconsciously, I think I wanted to be rich and make a lot of money so that I could kind of fix what had caused me to get out of my dream. And so it's very common to think that you can make a lot of money in finance. And so combining my two skill sets, my interest and my goal to be wealthy just decided to get into finance. Now, I can only imagine, especially at 14, when you're just envisioning becoming this professional athlete, really, right? And making a lot of money, all those things, you know, just how you would think about that at 14, much less older, trying to envision that and then it not happening or, you know, or having to stop. That could definitely set you in a couple of different directions. But it sounds like for you, you really focused in, you know, and took some action. But later on, you mentioned you house hacked something and that got you into real estate. Give us a little of that story. Yeah. So when I was entering my freshman year of college, my dad sat me down and he said, 
listen, you're probably going to make a decent salary when you graduate college. So if you're still living at home, when you graduate, you're going to have to start paying me rent. And I didn't think that was really unfair or unrealistic. I thought it was pretty fair to be honest with you, but I just didn't want to do it. Something in me was just like, I don't want to pay rent. And so I had always thought renting was throwing away money. And there's arguments on both sides of that. So I don't want to get into that. But at the time, 18 year old kid, I thought renting was throwing away money. And I said, all right, I'm going to buy a house as soon as I graduate. And so I can move there and I don't have to pay you any rent. And of course, my dad thought I was crazy. He didn't buy a house until he was in his 40s. None of my friends or family had ever owned houses or invested in anything. So I saved up as much money as I could through college. I had to pay my own way through school. And like I said, I was the first one in my family to ever go to college. So this whole time I was saving up money, getting educated, trying to find out how I could buy this house and avoid paying my dad rent. And so my senior year of college, I ended up buying a house and I moved there before I walked at my college graduation. And I did not think I was becoming a real estate investor. I did not do it as an investment. I just purely did it. So I didn't have to pay my dad rent. And then what ended up happening was it was a two bedroom condo. And I realized that I didn't even open the bedroom door for the second bedroom for months when I lived there. And I said, well, I should probably do something with this. And so I ended up renting out that bedroom for like 700 to $750 a month. My total all in cost, mortgage, taxes, insurance, HOA fees, everything was like 1100. So I was living for like 300 to $400 a month. And I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then I realized I'm like, I'm not really that smart. So somebody has definitely done this before me. And so that's when I started to search for this strategy. Of course, I found house hacking, I found bigger pockets. And up until this point, I had been pretty well versed in stock investing, but I never thought I could become a real estate investor because I thought you had to have a lot of money to do that. And then when I found bigger pockets, I found thousands and thousands of other people that were doing what I wanted to do. And they were no different than me. And that really just knocked down all my limiting beliefs and really jump started my real estate career. That's incredible. I also had many limiting beliefs and all of a sudden started going to conferences and thought, okay, wait a minute. All these people can do it. I can probably figure it out, right? And so it sounds like it's similar. So congratulations to you, though, on figuring that out and pushing forward. Okay, and so now, though, I know you're doing a lot of investing and a lot of long distance as well. And that alone is very fearful or brings a lot of fear to most people if they think, well, there's no way I can invest at a long distance. You know, it needs to be in my backyard. I think I was talking to when I was first getting started in real estate and trying to scale many years ago, just getting started, numerous people say, oh, you know, just find something here. Just find, you know, a single family or a duplex here close to you. And, you know, that's how most people get started. And all that I think is based out of fear, right? It doesn't have to be that way. But let's dive in there a little bit. How did you start getting into long distance investing? What does that look like in your business? It's entirely based on fear. And it's also based on these old notions of what real estate used to be like. And we could talk about that a little bit more. But how I got into long distance was I house hacked that first property. And then I did a live in flip for my second property, which is sort of like a form of a house hack. And then my third property, I did another house hack. And so between the second and third property, I knew I wanted to buy an actual rental, I wanted to do something that I didn't have to live in that was a true rental. And The market that I live in is pretty expensive. It's not the most expensive in the country by any means, but it is pretty expensive. I'm just outside of Boston. And so it's pretty expensive. And so to get into something that was multifamily, the single family stuff around here makes no sense in terms of an investment. So you you have to go multifamily if you want anything that makes sense financially for returns. And so to look into a multifamily, anything that's in a decent area with decent units is going to be upwards of 400, 500, 600,000. And so I was looking at having to come up with anywhere from hundred to $200,000, say, in cash just to buy this first rental. And between me and my business partner, Ryan, we were like, there's probably not going to be possible. I mean, maybe, maybe we could scrape this together in a couple of years between the two of us. But do we really want to put all of our money? We're going to save every penny we have into this one deal that we have no idea what we're doing. And so... We said, well, why don't we go long distance? Why don't we just try buying a cheaper property somewhere else? And so that's what we did. And so we said, well, you mentioned fear. And I think fear comes from loss, right? You know, losing your money. And so when I think of fear, I'm actually more fearful of buying that four to $600,000 multifamily where I live than I am buying the long distance property. And the reason for that is because When I bought my first long distance property, it was $65,000. It was a single family house in Texas. And we could talk about how I found that market a little bit if you'd like. But I didn't have fear for that because I felt the risk was really, really low. And that was what we decided to do was we said, let's find a property. Let's just test it out with something that's super low risk. 
And the way we define low risk is by the amount of the monthly mortgage payment, not so much by the price of the property, but by the mortgage payment. So we said, all right, we're going to buy this $65,000 house in Texas. And if everything goes as bad as it possibly can, we're horrible landlords. We don't know how to rent it out. This is just completely awful. Can we cover this mortgage payment until we could sell the property? And that's how we define risk. And the risk of us not being able to cover that mortgage payment is what we saw as the downside. And so on that $600,000 property up here, that might be a $4,000 mortgage. That's going to be hard for us to cover. But down there, that $65,000 property, it was like a $400 mortgage. Like he and I could easily cover that for as long as we needed to, to liquidate the property. So we just saw our risk is really, really low. We really redefined how risk is viewed in real estate. And we also, as I mentioned, there's a historical misconceptions around real estate that you have to be local, but technology has completely changed that. And so that's how we were able to go long distance. That property ended up working it out really well. And now we're up to five or so properties down there. No, that's awesome. And I think many people won't get into real estate, period, when they hear the term rental because of the fear of the management portion, right? Oh, I don't want to be taking the tenant calls. I don't want to be doing these things or whatever, having to go fix the toilet at midnight. And then you say, well, in Texas, you know, when you're on the East Coast, I mean, it's just like not even an option, you know, to most at that point. So getting past the the managing issue, you know, how did you do that? How do you manage well? How does that just no problem for you, you know, at at a long distance? So this is probably one of my favorite pieces to talk about. Finding the markets is probably my favorite. This is probably one of my second. Well, I want to go there too in a minute, but I know there's people thinking, wait a minute, you know, just managing something at a distance is difficult. How do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think people are misinformed there because it's not as hard as people think. And so that's why I like to talk about it. And so I do self-manage between my business partner and I, we self-manage all five single family properties that we have down there. And we're 2000 miles away. We've never been to this city. We've never seen any of the properties and we're doing it all from here. You've never seen any of the properties? Never even been to the town. Wow. Wow. Okay. Go ahead. I want to hear more. And so you mentioned that I can't go there. And that's what I love about this. I think a lot of people do wrong in real estate is they don't treat it like a business. And part of the reason why they don't treat it like a business is because it's local. The toilet breaks, they know they can just go over there. Or if something goes wrong, they know they can just go over there. That's not really how you run a real business, whether it's real estate or something else. You don't just go and check it all out yourself every single time. Being long distance forces you to treat real estate like a business and makes you find systems and processes to handle these things. And so for me, I was kind of forced into this because I'm a numbers guy. I went into finance, investing. I couldn't swing a hammer to save my life. I don't know how to fix anything. I'm not handy at all. So I always joke, but I'm kind of serious when I say like, even if I bought a rental property next door to me, if something broke, I mean, I could go over there and look at it, but I don't know what I'm looking at. I have zero idea. So I have to hire somebody to go fix it. And so it's the same way down there. Why does it matter if somebody calls me and says, Hey, my toilet's not working. And what I would do, whether it was next door or it was down in Texas, I hop on the phone and I say, Hey, I have a trusted plumber. Can you go take a look at whatever needs to be handled. And it's the same way with electricians or handyman or you know landscaping, whatever the case is, it's the, always the same answer. And so we leverage technology doing that. And the other key piece here is that we really focus on getting high, high, high quality tenants. And that helps a lot because now they're not super high maintenance for us. They're not hard to manage. If they have an issue, they're very respectful. They're very trustworthy and responsible. They just give us a call, say, hey, this is going on. And then I know that they're high quality. I know they're good people. So what I can do is I can just connect them with my contact down there, whether it's a plumber, electrician, handyman, whatever it is. I connect them with the tenant and say, Hey, just work out a time that works well for the tenant to get into the property. They go in, do what they need to do. They bill me and that's it. And it's really pretty simple. All right, Robert, I think it's interesting to talk about, well, even if there was a problem, if you were right there, you wouldn't be able to fix it yourself. I almost think it's like a blessing and a curse, but more of a blessing. It's kind of like when we started the podcast, I knew I couldn't do it all myself. So I just had to build the team from the very beginning. And if I had have tried to do it all myself, I would have gotten so frustrated and probably already quit. It would have been half done. And I think that applies here as well, because you just said, you know what? It's not worth my time to go learn how to fix the AC unit. You would have started trying to fix all of them then, right? Instead of trying to find the next property or grow your business or put in better systems and all those things. So I think it's more of a blessing than anything that, you know what, you just said, I just, I'm not good at those things. And I'm going to hire those people that are really good at that. What about some tech that you use to do this well, to manage it well? You mentioned using tech as well. Yeah. I mean, it's really pretty simple. There's not like this super complex, detailed tech that you have to use. We use 
an iPhone and FaceTime. I mean, those are like probably the biggest things. And the reason I mean that is because if there's a problem, the tenants can take pictures and just send it to us. A lot of times when we're acquiring properties, our agent will walk us through the property on FaceTime. So it's almost like we're there, but we're not. And going back to me not knowing what I'm looking at, I mean, a lot of times I don't even go to look at the houses just because I don't even know what I'm looking at. Like I couldn't tell you if something is wrong in the house. So it's no different if I'm on FaceTime or if I'm here. I can't see the details well enough when I'm there anyway. So I'm going to rely on the inspection report or somebody that knows what they're doing. So FaceTime has been big for us to be able to see the property. He takes videos and sends it to us as well. But other than that, I mean, we just use a couple software platforms. We use an accounting software. We use a property management software that's free, but basically that's how we collect rent. But I mean, it, it's really pretty simple. You just use a software to collect rent and accounting and then just ways to see the property and chat with your tenants. Nice. Let's talk about the markets. So I wanted to jump into that as well, how you're finding the markets that you're wanting to invest in. Because once you're comfortable with investing long distance, well, I mean, it's just wide open, right? Well, then it's down to finding that best market instead of being so confined to where you can easily drive to. So how do you do that? So there's a quote I heard, and I believe it's from David Green from Bigger Pockets, but if it's not, Whoever said it, it, it's had a big impact on me. And the quote is, live where you want to live, invest where the numbers make sense. And you're right that once you go long distance, you know that the entire world essentially is your playground and you could find a property anywhere that the numbers make sense. And so how I did this is I had a guest, I host a podcast as well. And I had a guest on the podcast, his name is Neil Bawa. And he has this strategy for analyzing markets and he uses six demographic data points And so this really, really spoke to me because being a quantitative financial guy, all these kind of qualitative ways of looking at markets, even like where you live and saying, oh, this market's improving, this neighborhood's improving. They didn't really have hard data. They just said, oh, it seems like it's improving. That didn't really sit well with me. I wanted data that really backed everything up. So when I heard Neil's strategy, it just really spoke to me because he has data and numbers to really back everything up. And so basically, Neil has this strategy where you look at these six demographic data points and they have to meet certain criteria. And if they do, then it's probably a good rental market. And so what I did was I paid a software developer to scrape consensus data off the internet for 7,000 cities across the US. And he exported all of these six demographic data points for those 7,000 cities into an Excel spreadsheet. And I lived in an Excel spreadsheet for... 12 hours a day for probably five or six years in my corporate world career. And so I was pretty good at Excel. And so I did some manipulation and I found out what are the best cities with all these demographic data points. And I ranked them from one to 7,000. And so my business partner and I started to go through the top 25 and we said, let's cross off anything that doesn't have inventory that we can actually purchase. So if they don't have any properties we're looking for, or there's just nothing for sale, we'll cross that off. Or if there's no real estate professionals. So if you have a great market, but there's nobody there, like no good agents or no good electricians or handymen, it's probably not a good market to invest in. So we crossed off any of those out of the top 25 that didn't meet those two criteria. And then we had like 10 or 15 left. And we were pretty open to any of them. It didn't really matter to us. We didn't have any contacts at the point. We were just wanted to find a deal. And so we made offers across all of these cities. I think we had like 13 offers maybe out at once. And we had this was ranging from Texas to Idaho to Ohio to Alabama to the Carolinas to Florida. I mean, all across. And we basically said, wherever we get this first deal is where we'll continue to build. And so we ended up getting our first deal in Texas. Our agent ended up being an absolute rock star. And so it's just worked out really well. We've decided to continue to build there. But that's how I ended up finding the market. It was strategic anyway. You know, it wasn't just this randomness. Or like you said, well, I feel like there's been growth there. Well, okay. (laughs) How do you know that, right? And so you did find a system. And we've had Neil on the show numerous times. We've talked about some of the market statistics he uses. And yeah, well, they call him the mad scientist something. I can't remember now. But but yeah, I love his systematic way of thinking through things like that how he does that and sounds like, you know, that's been successful for you as well. And building that sheet, even taking the steps of hiring someone to scrape tons of data for you to review, right? And narrow that down in a big way. And I think that just says things about you, you know, and just the time and detail that you went into to ensure you're finding the best market. And I think that, you know, is going to pay forward in many ways. Well, you know, anything else about just investing long distance, Robert, that maybe you get questions about that you'd like to share with listeners? I would just say that it's not that scary. And I really 
do think it's a great way to get started. I don't think you need to have a ton of experience before you do it. And I just really highly encourage people to redefine risk and redefine how you think about risk. There's a lot of gurus out there that recommend going as big as possible, as early as possible. And I agree with that. I'm a, you know, I'm a really hardworking guy. I have big goals, but I personally think you should probably start a little bit smaller in real estate first. And then if you want to go big for your second property, fine. But I think you should at least get started on a small scale. And that's just what I highly encourage everybody listening to do. Do you have any predictions for the real estate market over the next say six to 12 months? I do not. I don't make any predictions. And this comes to my background from stock investing. So when I got into finance. I fell absolutely in love with Warren Buffett. I've been out to Berkshire Hathaway's annual meetings out in Omaha. And so I spent 10 years studying stock investing before I even got into real estate. So my background is really ingrained in Warren Buffett principles. And I've taken a lot of that to real estate. And I think it's really helped me. And one of those things that he does is he doesn't try and forecast the markets. He doesn't try and time the markets. He doesn't try to do anything with macroeconomic factors. And it's the same way for me with real estate. And that was a big shift for me because when I first got started, I always thought I'm going to wait for a crash before I buy something. And then I just realized I'm never going to buy a deal. I think two or three years went by when I was thinking that I didn't buy anything. And then I just said, you know what? If the numbers make sense, I need to buy a deal. And that's my philosophy now. I don't try and forecast or time the market. I have no idea where it's going. I think if anybody tells you they know where it's going, they're lying because nobody knows. And if the numbers make sense, buy a deal and keep going. No, that's awesome. So all that background though in the stocks, what's your philosophy now between you know stocks and real estate? Or do you have both and your percentages you know, of investing in both? Absolutely, I do both. And so that's one of the things I think is a little bit different about me as well is what you find with a lot of real estate investors. And I don't think this is necessarily bad or wrong, but a lot of real estate investors are very, very anti the stock market. And I don't personally think that's the right strategy. I think there's room in everybody's portfolio for stocks and real estate. Maybe you're a little more heavy on real estate than you are stocks. But I personally believe that there's room in everybody's portfolio for both. And so I actually don't work a W-2 job anymore. I invest in real estate and host my podcast full-time. But prior to that, I kept my allocations very simple. Anything that I earned W-2-wise went to the stock market, just went into my 401k, and I just kept it simple that way. And then anything I earned outside of that or saved outside of that would go into real estate. And that was pretty much simply how I allocated it. Today, it's a little bit more detailed just because I don't have that W-2 job or W-2 income anymore. And I'm really more focused on passive cash flow. And so if I'm looking for cash flow, I default to real estate. If I'm looking for more appreciation, I personally default more to the stock market. So when I think about, I have this $1 I want to invest... Do I want that dollar to go out and bring back more dollars now that I can spend on a monthly basis through cash flow? I'll put it in real estate. If I wanted to go appreciate and come back in 10 years with more, then I'll put it into the stock market. So that's kind of my philosophy on the two. I appreciate you breaking that down. I think that was very simple and well said for the listeners and myself, just how you think about investing that dollar. Just with your background, we don't have many people on the show that's experienced in investing in stocks, probably as you are. So that's incredible. I appreciate that. Tell us a way you have recently improved your business, Robert, that we could apply to ours. Probably hiring a virtual assistant. And I just have so many different projects going on right now that I realize I can't do everything myself. And we talk about not being able to go fix the toilet. That's true. That's one piece of it. But then the next piece is there's still other stuff in that business that I can do that I probably shouldn't be doing from long distance. And so whether it's real estate or my podcast or some other projects that I'm working on, having a virtual assistant to help me out with some of those things has really been impactful. And it's really helped take some things off my plate and getting organized and having a plan for every day has also really helped. Having a plan for every day. Right. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? How you do that? Yeah. So I actually created this thing called a daily time log. And every single morning when I wake up, I fill out this daily time log. And at the top, I put the date. Below that, I put what time I woke up and how long I slept for. That's just kind of my personal preference. I like to know if I got a good night's sleep or not. I personally think sleep is really, really important. And then below that, I write one thing I'm grateful for every single morning. Then below that, I write my three major goals that I'm working towards, whatever they are. They're not tasks. They're not to-do lists for the day. They're just my three major goals that I'm working on right now. And then below that, I list all my tasks for my day. And I have four different categories. I have things that have to be done today, things that should be done soon, things that have a little bit of while, but I got to do them eventually. And then things that I just got to get to at some point, there's no rush. Fill out all those. And I make sure I do those tasks every single day. And then at the bottom, towards the end of the day, I have a self-reflection, things that went well, things that went bad, if I read, if I drank enough water, etc. 
And I do that every single day. And it helps me stay really, really organized. It takes probably five to 10 minutes total. And it really, really helps. No, that's incredible. You have a plan. I mean, every day you're writing those things down that you plan to accomplish that day. I think that alone is like, is instrumental in moving things forward, right? Taking action. I always ask, you know, about daily habits people have that they're disciplined about that have helped them achieve success. Sounds like that's a big one for you. Is there anything else there that you want to elaborate on as far as daily habits that have helped you achieve success? I think there's a lot of common ones that people would recommend, you know, reading, networking, things like that. But I think one of the ones that not enough people talk about that has had a big impact on me is exercise and fitness. And I talk about how fitness and exercise gives you an edge in whatever you're trying to do. And a lot of people, for some reason, when you bring up fitness, they just default to being a bodybuilder or like an Olympic weightlifter. And I'm just like, you don't have to do that. You just got to be active. You got to go to the gym and work out or go for a walk or go for a run. I don't really care what it is that you do. You don't have to be the next, you know, world's strongest man. But just getting some sort of exercise every single day, and it has to be like actually hard work. You can't just go lightly walk around your neighborhood for 20 minutes and call it a day. I'm talking like an actual good solid workout and drink enough water throughout the day. It's just massive. I think it has a huge impact on people's lives that they don't see. It keeps you sharp mentally, gives you a ton of energy, and it just really, really helps in so many ways. I couldn't agree more. And my mentor of mine says like sweat every day. (laughs) That's his motto. I love that. So how do you like to give back? So I like to give back in a couple different ways. One is that I just through the podcast, you know, when I first got started, everything I wanted to do in life was just about money. I just wanted to make as much money as I could. And then once I started the podcast, people started to reach out and they'd say that I'm really changing their lives. And that's been huge. It's a free resource for everybody, just like your podcast. And being able to impact people and give education in a free way like that has been huge. Also, probably this is very new. So this is going to come out. By the time this comes out, this episode, this will probably be in full swing. But I just officially got the letter from the IRS that my nonprofit has been approved as a tax exempt organization. So I'm super, super excited about that. That's a way that I'm going to love to give back. I've been doing a little bit of it without the actual organization. And so I filed the paperwork months ago. It took a while with the IRS to get everything approved. But I'm super excited to have the tax exempt real nonprofit going. And and I'm super excited about that. Nice. What's the mission? So the mission is to help everyday people with everyday issues. And so it's called the Front Door Foundation. And so the idea behind it is that we're opening the front door to opportunities through real world scholarships. And so my idea for this came from... There's a lot of amazing charities and nonprofits out there that are doing amazing things, fighting world hunger and cancer and all these things. But one of the things that I feel like that was missing was, and those are great, but the problem is there's a lot of everyday people that are struggling too with a lot of different things. Just the other day, I was at a gas station and this woman was crying because she didn't have enough money to fill up her car and her car was empty. And those are the types of things that I want to help people with. Those are the things that I really think I can make an impact with. I walk over and fill her gas tank for her. Or you're at the grocery store and somebody's card gets declined and they can't buy groceries or they just can't afford groceries. You go and you buy their groceries for them. And so that's really what I want to do. And I also think that sometimes there's a lack of transparency with charities. You know, you donate money to it and you never know where that money goes. You know the general mission, but you don't necessarily know where it goes. So one of the things I'm really, really going to try to do with this organization is to allow people to track where their money's going. So if you donate money and that gets to buy somebody groceries, my goal, and I'm not sure tactically how I'm going to actually be able to do this logistically, but my goal is to be able to tell you, Hey, you donated a hundred dollars. That hundred dollars was part of buying this person who couldn't afford groceries. And so transparency is massive for me. And so I say our three pillars are focusing on helping people with fitness or health, finance, and then just everyday problems. And so I want to help people with everyday education. I think there's not enough scholarships or opportunities to help people pay for untraditional forms of education like books and online courses. So if somebody is struggling and they can't afford to buy a book or a course, I want to pay for that for them. And I want to help people realize they don't have to go to college and help fund these other ways that they can't necessarily afford themselves. No, I appreciate you sharing that. And congratulations on getting it approved. We also have a foundation and I wondered how long it was going to take to get approved, right? And it was great to receive that letter, but congratulations to you. And just the desire to give back in that way and be purposeful, you know, about giving back and so grateful to hear that. But Robert, 
Thank you for the show today and just really helping us break that fear of that long distance investing as much as anything and thinking through, hey, if all these other people can do it, I can do it too. And it doesn't have to be that scary. We can make it happen. It doesn't have to be in our backyard. But Robert, how can people get in touch with you and learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. The best way to find me is on Instagram or Twitter. Username is the Robert Leonard, or you can check out the podcast. I have two of them. One is called Millennial Investing. The other is Real Estate 101. You just search those in your favorite podcast player. They should pop right up. If you have any questions about anything we talked about, I'd really like to give back. I answer every DM. Just send me a DM on social media. I'm happy to help. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.